bound I can't help but wonder where I'm bound Where I'm bound Can't help but wonder where I'm bound It's a hot and dusty road It's a hard and heavy load And the folks you meet ain't always kind Some are bad, some are good Some have done the best they could Some have tried to ease my troubled mind And I can't help but wonder where I'm bound, where I'm bound Can't help but wonder where I'm bound I have been around this land just to doing the best I can Trying to find what I was meant to do And the faces that I see are as worried as can be And it looks like they are wondering too And I can't help but wonder where I'm bound, where I'm bound Can't help but wonder where I'm bound are you searching for a kind face, a friendly face, someone to tell your troubles to, someone to ease your troubled mind? Can't you find anyone who will listen? The, uh, the uh, neighborhood bar, the barber shop was a place when maybe a man and his wife would have a little argument at home. He'd walk, he'd storm out of the house. He'd go down and tell his troubles to the bartender. <laughs> he listened. He did. <laughs> yeah. And it, <laughs> I say your bartender has to uh, have the personality in order to meet the public. And a lot of times you do hear a lot of people's troubles. They, they, don't, they might not have uh, anyone else to tell them to. So you hear the troubles and you have to listen. And uh, this, uh, they just might want to talk. Uh, a number of different things. But there's one thing for sure. If you're a bartender, you're going to hear people's troubles. <laughs> there's no doubt about it. <laughs> we never should have thought. My husband wanted a big car, and that car hated him. <laughs> it never did anything wrong when John was driving it. If it was going to get a vapor lock, it got a vapor lock. And it was always on Friday on my busy days over on a hill, and I was forever leaving the car with most of the policemen who said, this car won't move. And also get the impression around you that sometimes you're more concerned about others than you are yourself. Your wishes are very favorable. You're born under a good aspect, and you should see success during the end part of 65 and into the beginning of 1966. Sometimes you believe in the future, and sometimes you don't. But I do feel the future is going to be kind of kind where you're concerned. You have a lot of spiritual good luck around you. Many ways, your spiritual card is good to the home, good with money, and it seems like with health. You will have this luck very high for the next seven years. I don't know, but it's vibrations, the seven spiritual years you're under. But I think whatever it is, you yourself should be able to pick up very deep feelings because you are very spiritual. Like you should never go against what you feel or believe because I think basically there's a lot of depths in you, a lot of deep meaning. But I just feel like if there's a saying to thine own self, be true. If you can't find anyone to listen, you can always read a good book. Tension is a condition of 20th century man. We all have tensions, and we all have our own special way of relieving them. Conflict, tension, 
stress. They all add up to trouble, so much trouble you don't know where to turn. When life pushes us too far, we can lose our balance. Then what do you do? If you're in trouble, if you've got a problem, one that eats away at you day after day, what can you do about it? If you were in that kind of trouble, where would you go? That's a good question. Uh, I guess I'd call my doctor first. Oh, geez, I don't know right now. I don't know. I have never had that occasion to uh, call for, you know, uh, to ask about, and um, I, I really don't know. I have no idea. Well, to a uh, professional person, such as, oh, a marriage counselor, a priest, someone that really knew what they were talking about. Actually, to the family first. I know I should go to council guidance, but uh, usually those things are solved at home. Uh, actually, I've never seen a mentally ill uh, person. Uh, if they were mentally ill, I didn't know about it. See, I don't know. Well, I haven't talked to anybody that's been uh, like that, so I wouldn't really know. We don't like to think about mental illness. It's something that happens to other people, never to us. When it does happen, we don't like to admit we need help. Everybody else seems to be solving his own problems. We don't like to seek professional help. Why are we so reluctant to seek help? Well, I think one of the reasons is that uh, the, the old idea, uh, which um, that there's something morally wrong about being mentally ill, that um, it's some sort of a blot on a person's character. It's the old history of mental disease. It started out wrong. Uh, that these people are disciples of the devil or possessed by evil. And uh, it was handled at first by the religious groups, and then secondly, when they failed, they were just thrown away in a dungeon somewhere and forgotten. And they heard the horrible stories of the asylums and the treatments, that, the fumbling at treatment that was going on. And in our minds, in the collective mind, uh, mental illness is still an evil. And the psychiatrist and anyone that helps him is a magician or someone with a dark cape, a hypnotist. And... We don't like to admit weakness. Sometimes it's just easier to run away from the problem than to admit it exists. We find uh, uh, much of this uh, in our caseload. Families who will leave uh, uh, communities where they have uh, at least superficially, roots, and uh, are having a difficult time adjusting. Uh, the job situation is not good. Uh, uh, they're probably having other kinds of difficulties. And in this day and age, when it's uh, relatively uh, uh, simple to buy a, a, a used automobile for little or nothing, uh, cart your family in this automobile and uh, come to Pittsburgh because uh, uh, someone had once said to you in your associations in your home community that uh, there is a kind of a, an economic boom in Pittsburgh, and here they come. No resources, nowhere to go, no place, no place to stay. These are the people that become our responsibility. Other times they just don't know what to do. Uh, I think this is true in many cases of people in trouble, whether it's this kind of trouble or another kind of trouble. They just don't know what to do or where to go to, to seek the kind of help that they need. But of course, with mental illness, as with every illness, we feel that their own family physician is an awfully good place to start. Um, the more people would uh, look to their own physicians who know them well, the better off they would be. Certainly their clergyman, their pastor, is another place where they can uh, very often get the beginning help that they need. But clergymen and doctors have their problems, too. But there are groups within the church which feel that um, a concomitant of the Christian faith is some sort of happy and carefree, problem-free life. The two things are somewhat synonymous. Uh, this is a misunderstanding, I think, uh, particularly in the Christian faith, 
this is not a faith which um, is concerned with uh, relieving an individual of the difficulties of life, but helping them meet and cope with those difficulties more realistically with some sort of, of hope. As one of our staff put it, they seem to think they should be able to do at least one miracle a day or else they're a failure. The reason we're in counseling at, at all um, initially, I feel, is that people come to see us for counseling. Uh, it's not a question of um, whether we have a role or not or what it is. It's forced upon us by um, uh, people coming to the pastor's study, calling him on the telephone, asking him to come to their home day after day for some sort of counseling. Uh, we've already heard people say that they would go to their doctor first, but one problem they'll encounter oftentimes is that their doctor hasn't had a lot of training in this particular field, and uh, while they think he's the one to treat illness, he'll not really be prepared to take care of them or have found ways to arrange his time to deal with them. And the only thing he'll think about is referral. This is a problem for many patients and for many doctors. Hello? Oh, yes. I'm very glad that you called back. Yes. Yes. Well, we were able to um, make an appointment for you. And if you can this keep that... This telephone is manned 24 hours a day to answer calls for help to give information to people in trouble. Next Who calls here? Well, we have referrals from many different people. For instance, this morning, um, a minister called to ask for help uh, for an unmarried mother. A feature writer from a local paper called to refer a situation that had come to his attention. And um, a doctor called to ask for information about available nursing homes. The police department called for information on where to send uh, a pre-delinquent boy whom they felt could be really helped by some counseling. Uh, corporation personnel director called for information about referral for one of his employees with a family problem. Uh, most of our calls, however, come directly from people in need on various kinds of things, marital problems, child protection, care for the sick, medical care for the aged, financial problems, rehabilitation of handicapped people. I'm a social worker, and if, uh, I work in low-income neighborhoods. If people want to go to find some help about a personal emotional problem or a family problem, I would normally think of sending them to one of three principal institutions in the city of Pittsburgh, uh, those being Western Psychiatric Institute and Clinic, uh, Pittsburgh Child Guidance Center and uh, Family and Children's Service. Mm -hmm. um, these are the biggest and best known institutes uh, for servicing uh, people uh, with emotional problems and uh, two of the three are United Fund Community Chest supported. Uh, Western Psych is not. Uh, if I sent uh, these people there, uh, first of all they run into the waiting, line, the waiting list. Mm -hmm. this, is, this is a big problem. Uh, unless it's an extreme emergency, uh, they wouldn't get any help. All right, once they get there and they're interviewed for intake, and the worker talks to them, they'll be seen for evaluation one way or another by a social worker or a psychiatrist or a psychologist. They may even be tested. Um, they'll be eventually seen if they wait long enough. And in most cases, if they're from the kind of backgrounds I told you about, if they're the hardcore, multi-problem type families, they're going to end up lasting four or five sessions at the most. And both the therapist and the patient will be terrifically frustrated, and they'll terminate. The uh, young psychiatrist himself is too prone to uh, accept the fact that these people come from uh, a subculture, that they're deprived anyway, and that any language uh, between them can can't be surmounted, there's no communication at all. And it's easy for them to say uh, that they can't help and they should go someplace else. Uh, once a person in a group like this makes an effort to get specific help and is rebuffed, it doesn't take long for them to forget the whole medical profession. I think the problem starts before the difficulty in communication. I think the problem with many people 
in such groups as you speak about is that they can't even be gotten into the presence of a psychiatrist. They're too frightened even to come. The problem presently is that we don't have enough facilities, you see, and so that perhaps we have to be selective. It's sort of uh, like the disaster uh, training. You pick out the ones that can live and let the rest go. Staff at all at the treatment agencies many times, and they tell me with no question about it, they're not amenable to treatment. People of a certain educational level and income level and from a certain milieu, a certain kind of environment, are not amenable to treatment. So therefore, we write off perhaps a third of the population in the United States is, quote, not amenable to treatment, unquote. Uh, they don't send them anywhere else, necessarily. They just uh, let them go. And we push them out into the areas of uh, quasi-medical uh, profession, or the advisors, or the tea leaf readers. And uh, the only place you see this is is in the subculture group, where they soon learn that to be frustrated, to have a three-year waiting list in the child guidance clinic, or a five-year waiting list in the outpatient department, this doesn't make sense. If they had uh, a coronary or a pneumonia and had to stand around waiting three years for help, it, they just don't understand the difference. In our clinic, any patient referred by a physician is scheduled to be seen. Unfortunately, the uh, rate of referral is such that we often have a waiting list. And this is exasperating to all concerned, including the clinic staff. But all patients are, who are referred are scheduled and accepted, are scheduled to be seen and then evaluated. At the conclusion of the assessment, then we have to make the decision in view of the limitations on treatment time and the staff available, which ones can be treated. Uh, this means then that some people who, uh, in current situation, some people who have a psychiatric diagnosis are not going to be able to get treatment. There's never going to be enough specialized care, psychiatrists, psychologists, and social workers in a clinic setting to take care of all of the emotional ills that might occur in a community. The more we learn about uh, how we can treat problems, the more need there is for treatment. Uh, not that the problems particularly are increasing, but we just uh, can do much more about it now. If we can't, you know, save this prior generation, we can intervene and try to save the children. One way or another, we got to move. Yes, there are waiting lists. Uh, not usually at the agencies. They're usually accepted quite readily. There are waiting lists. Uh, for institutional placement very often, particularly uh, in regard to retarded uh, children. We have here a book that we um, keep a list of our unmet needs. Sometimes there is no available resource um, immediately, and we keep a list of these things and refer them, discuss them with the um, planning committee of the Health and Welfare Association so that they're aware of the unmet needs in the community. We are not, in this organization, uh, providing a continuing service to people to solve their problems. We are just the link between those people and the resources to meet them. We are constantly involved in a coordinating function, as you say, um, helping uh, service agencies, including our own, to mesh their efforts toward a common goal of helping to solve some of our community's mental health problems. So this is uh, what the general practitioner is doing all the time. He's waiting around in a swamp trying to find some way to get out and take the rest with him. Well, unfortunately, we have uh, some uh, public and private family agencies, but I don't think this is nearly enough. I don't think it even begins to, to meet the need. I think what we really need is, is, is certainly more uh, uh, outpatient kind of uh, mental health clinics. Yes, Pittsburgh could use more outpatient uh, service. We must remember, however, the way the population is going and the way the multiplication of mental disease is uh, piling up, that we'll probably never have enough trained people to really keep up with this. Now, what is being done 
uh, through both federal and state funds is an intensive survey by some 1,200 uh, professional and lay people uh, on the uh, needs, the facilities, the services available in Pennsylvania and those which we think should be available to have at least reasonably adequate care for the mentally ill and the mentally retarded people in this state. How long will the study take? Now, this study is to be completed by mid-July 1965. Uh, however, the actual implementation, the building of community mental health centers, which we hope will come from this, uh, is probably several years away. Perhaps we can uh, understand where we are better if we step back just a moment. Mental illness was first thought of, in this country perhaps, as having to do with people who were acutely psychotic and had to go to an asylum, and those asylums were out in the country. So this was people out there. We still have the hospitals that were built out there. In Allegheny County, there's Mayview, Woodville, Dixmont. What's going on now is that psychiatry and psychiatrists have begun to deal with people as outpatients have begun to find out how much emotional difficulty there is, how many people there are who might be labeled mentally ill, and the federal government has supported the state government in undertaking a basic rethinking. How shall we plan for the mentally ill in Pennsylvania? And over 500 people have been working in this last year in laying the groundwork and making the specific arrangements for a comprehensive mental health plan for Pennsylvania. This, will, this was designed to establish mental health centers. In Pennsylvania, the prevailing feeling, I think, is that these should not be separate from existing institutions, but should be related to existing institutions, probably hospitals, but a place where a person can go with an immediate complaint, where he can get outpatient treatment, where he can get day care, night care, short-term hospitalization, and if necessary, perhaps some long-term hospitalization. These may not replace the state hospitals, but it will be related, the comprehensive mental health plan will be related to the state hospitals and permit um, in each county or each geographical area a place where the spectrum of mental health care is available. What are the times? The community mental health plan is certainly a significant move in the right direction, but the pressing problem remains. What about those who need help now? What about those for whom frustrations are mounting and help seems far off? Is there no help for these troubled minds right now? siren means an emergency. Someone did not receive help before the need became critical, or perhaps no one recognized that help was needed. Could this crisis have been avoided? People in trouble go for help to those who make themselves available. There is no waiting list at the corner tavern. The store front minister's front door is wide open. The time to get help is when you first need it. Now, today, before your problem gets too big to handle. Many problems which could develop into serious emotional disturbances can be helped before they get out of hand. Maybe it's just a lack of acceptance of mental illness as an illness which can be treated and which like many physical illnesses, the sooner it is diagnosed and the sooner it is treated, the greater the possibilities for recovery. If you can get most of them earlier enough before they even get to the point of either a problem to the community or a burden to the community, uh, this is what you aim for. If you talk about prevention, uh, uh, early identification and prevention is a good place to start uh, in the neighborhoods and in the schools. 
And I think that we, we find people where are applying where problems are much less serious than uh, perhaps might have been the case earlier because people know there are resources and they know that it is a healthy thing to apply rather than necessarily a stigma. And taking care of the mentally ill begins in the family, in the work situation, in our social living, and anywhere that we could recognize this and bring it to attention to someone, we may be able to avert a crisis. And you know, mental people that have a mental illness, they recover, recover much sooner than some people. They have other types of illness. Most of the time in, in the fairly overpopulated area, the family doctor is called to see the the catastrophes, the person who has really become uh, away from reality. Uh, but I'd say about 40 or 50 percent of the times you're one step too late. The police have been there and the case is gone and you don't do much help anyway. Sometimes I don't know what to say. Sometimes I don't know what to do. No one to talk my troubles to. No one to talk my troubles to. Who are you going to tell your troubles to? The line forms to the right for early treatment and it's getting longer every day. Admitting that you need help is the first important step. Watch out for that next step, it's a big one. Where are you going to find help? We know the supply of trained people is short, and we know the ones we have want to help you as soon as possible, but they're busy. There are waiting lists. There isn't enough money to build enough clinics to help enough people like you. Does it help to have somebody tell you your statistic that you're the one in 10 Americans who has a mental problem? Are you cheered by the news that things will be better by 1975? Does anybody care about you right now? Is anybody trying to help you right now? Somewhere between the most highly trained and the layman, we have to have a range of skills available, which should be recognized by everyone as being most valuable in helping people. Yeah, I think we have to train some professional and non-professional personnel. There's not enough personnel around. Never will be enough professional personnel around. The doctors now are beginning to realize that they, there are so many people with mental illness in order that they can have their services uh, extend to all the people, they must make use of other disciplines. Mm -hmm the discipline of, uh, of uh, psychology, social service, counseling, and above all, nursing. The nurses are becoming very active and they are co-therapists, they call them now, with the doctor. If we had more uh, the ancillary help that we're speaking of, the nurses and the homemakers and the community people that were interested in this problem, I think we could bridge this subculture gap. The idea that nursing is uh, uh, a nurse is required to do many other things than we previously thought a nurse needed to do and to know is very much with us in planning our curriculum in the School of Nursing. There are so many patients that need the doctor's care that the doctor could uh, have a nurse as a co-therapist with him or he could have a psychologist or a counselor who would, uh, under the doctor's direction, of course, have some of these meetings, these uh, psychotherapy meetings with the patient and help the doctor in that way. That would enable the doctor to take care of a greater number of patients. After I'd been in general practice for a while, I began to realize that uh, what I 80 percent of what I was seeing uh, was apparently emotional and the exotic diseases and things that I had been taught to look for in medical school and in later training and residency weren't there. Uh, people had other problems that because of
poor training at that time in, uh, in the medical schools and in, in further professional training, mental health and mental problems had been left to the murky province of the psychiatrists. So many general phys physicians never did have good training in psychiatry. Uh, looking around for some place to learn, um, I found out through the American Academy of General Practice that such a program had been offered at the University of Pittsburgh. This was about eight years ago. And it was in the form of group sessions for general practitioners and other interested physicians who uh, eight or ten of us would meet on a Wednesday for one or two hours and present cases. At Staunton Clinic in Pittsburgh, doctors are doing just that, meeting under the supervision of staff psychiatrists to discuss cases, exchange information and experience. The seminars are aimed at helping the doctor to become more aware of what is going on in the patient's mind when the doctor and the patient are together. Well, that's, uh, that sort of gets me. Here she's living in the same home with her husband with whom she, from whom she's divorced, and uh, this other fellow comes to visit her. The social disorganization bothers you. Bothers me, yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. And I'm not, uh, I've sort of made half-hearted attempts to tell her either to get rid of this, this man. Why would, would you want to do that? I know, I'm doing the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, you say let things ride the not way they... So, not so much that you're doing the wrong thing. But uh, on the other hand, what I think you have to evaluate is what powers this thing? What makes her go this way? Like with Bob's case, what makes it go so far? What gives it the, the push to send them off to California? What gives it the push to destroy his stomach and to make the 15-year-old ill? And, you know, all these things. That these are, I think, we have to judge relatively enormous forces at work. I think the really important thing that's emerging to those of us who worked in the task forces on the comprehensive mental health plan this summer and elsewhere is that uh, we each have roles to play, we each have a, an identity that is our own, and that if we can talk things over more, we can uh, uh, learn to respect the role that the other profession has in the field. This is going to take some time because some of us have been contemptuous of others at times and thought, oh, they, don't, they can't do anything really. Training programs, I think, can best be designed which help in initial stages an individual to find his own identity, his own role and then be at ease in talking with other professionals about, well, what's your role, what's your identity, what can you do, and how is what I do related to what you can do. These are the kinds of things, I think, that are very important, and we've only just begun to do. You no longer have, uh, I'll use the word fears, about referring a patient back to their minister and subsequently seeing them a year or two later in the same problem because they have this uh, same type of ancillary training and the group sessions in which they're realizing that they can do more than they were doing before. The Pittsburgh Pastoral Institute is a non-denominational center designed to help clergymen and members of their congregations cope with the complexities of modern life. The Institute provides many services, among them a center for clergy to refer difficult pastoral problems for advanced counseling and psychiatric care, research facilities for future improvement in pastoral care, and training programs for the clergy to supplement their education and experience. Under supervision of trained staff, clergymen meet and discuss problems encountered in their daily parish work. And uh, this is how you can utilize, for example, uh, brief encounters with other human beings as, as little samples of their lives and of their life patterns. That the big, the so-called big curves of life, the big patterns in life over periods of years are uh, reproduced sometimes amazingly in, in brief encounters with, with other human beings. There's one problem with the parish priest has, and that is that when you begin to be sensitive to these things, you also have to avoid any um, image that you're studying other people 
Otherwise, the whole uh, sense of real concern and love uh, seems to be not communicated to people. Um, I've sometimes been charged by certain people that, uh, you know, now don't study me or uh, don't look too closely uh, on, you know, on this basis that the tendency to analyze too much and not seem to care enough for them as individuals. I get nonsense, don't you? No, I don't think so. I think that uh, at one time I didn't care about people, but I loved to study them, thinking that somehow studying them I could... Uh, know myself better, but I really didn't care about them as persons. And I think that uh, as but Christians... But there's a trap here, though, Tom. There can be. You have the trap being, being that we... you aren't doing anything for them either, and that you're just their kind of slave, you see, and, uh, and they want you to keep on being this way. And then the minute you begin to get in on what's going on in their lives through awareness and study, uh, they don't want that <laughs> that same way. Mm. And that's why I think that, has that uh, that's the nonsense side of it. But there is a, there's a definitely a narrow line here that uh, right, okay. the power of sensitivity is uh, one that uh, can be used for great help, but it also can be a very protectionist kind of thing for us, that you satisfy yourself that because you're looking at the patterns of other people's behavior that you're somehow helping them, and I don't think this follows either. Now, there are many people in the community who are in positions of responsibility. Clergy are among them. There are other people also, teachers, general practitioners, uh, policemen, all sorts of people uh, who could be helped right at the front line. And we could do more even in, in helping the families who are the first line of defense to be more effective not only in preventing these emotional problems but also in meeting them after they begin to develop. I don't think we uh, know which profession is best able to treat people uh, across the board. Well, we need uh, an educational program for everyone in the community, the police, and I'm sure that the police would welcome this. I think there's no question that others, uh, uh, that education all the way up and down the line of professional groups and then even perhaps in high schools and elsewhere, beginning education in some of these principles of laymen as they can understand themselves better, not to be therapists, but just to be better organized and understand themselves better. Education all the way up and down the line is important as far as I'm concerned. I don't have any answers except to say that one of the first things that our institutions might do is to set a sort of, a sort of priority list, uh, allocate some of their funds to decentralize their services and go into these low-income neighborhoods, begin to have their staff learn about the kind of life and problems these people have and the kind of obstacles they must encounter to make a trusting uh, relationship, experiment, experiment with short-term treatment sessions instead of uh, the long-term classical psychotherapeutic one, two, three, four-year treatment approach, which is unfeasible, uneconomical, won't answer the problem. Uh, I'm just suggesting an aggressive experimental approach to the low-income population. There is experimentation going on. There are people and organizations trying to find new ways of meeting the needs of the community. But sometimes the needs have a way of changing even while we're trying to meet them. Dr. Gwynne Chambers, a psychologist on the staff of Western Psychiatric Institute, began a training program for college graduates interested in child care. We thought uh, that these people would be mainly working in residential treatment small units or in the large state hospitals. We found that instead of taking care of children when they took their first jobs, they became the in-service training person. So we had not filled the gap that we had hoped to fill. Untrained people were still giving the care directly to children. It was in the hope to correct this that we applied for a, an NIMH grant, National Institute of Mental Health, to enlarge our basic program and to start a new one for high school graduates. These people, we thought, would roughly fill the position which is now known as the hospital attendant. A few of them ha are taking hospital jobs, but much to our surprise, we find that the community at large is asking for these people in new ways. For example, there are projects now for the socially handicapped child or, or socially deprived, I believe is the term they used, they are using. And our graduates are being filtered off into that direction 
uh, assisting school teachers, not as school teachers, but giving the proper care to these children who are difficult to incorporate in a regular classroom. Another kind of experimentation is going on at the Southeast Community Guidance Association, where police, teachers, nurses, doctors, the people who see trouble every day can be trained to recognize potential danger spots before they explode into community problems. Seminars and institutes give guidance to many community leaders who are called on to offer help and strength, but often have no way of knowing what to do. This, I think, is one of the things that we have to recognize, that uh, people are helping others all the time. And uh, if we can help them have a, a greater understanding of uh, the type of help they are giving, then we feel that we will have uh, answered uh, a need in this community. How can these other disciplines help you when you're in trouble? What can your clergyman or your nurse or your doctor do for you if they are aware of your trouble? You have a head start on a psychiatrist every time because you actually fit into the, the family group and you know a lot about them before they even say anything. I think of many cases that we have received of people who have not been able to work through, say, a grief reaction to a loss in their own family, who if their clergyman, for instance, had been just a little more carefully trained and had a little more depth of understanding. This clergyman, this pastor, could have gone to these people right at the time of the loss and been more helpful in helping them to express their feelings, to work through what, what is a process of growing and healing, and would have prevented future consequences of a more serious nature that a patient uh, is going to have to be taught to take care of himself because of the disease condition he has. And he is a patient who is very anxious, very concerned about what lies ahead of him. And uh, he's not perhaps uh, able at the moment to listen to what he's being told because his anxiety level is so high. Uh, our purpose in, in trying to get the nurse to know uh, something more about mental health and problems which patients face is to recognize that the patient is not ready for the kind of teaching that she finds necessary and to work with him later when he is ready to accept what she has to tell him. Uh, no, I think we can diversify the type of personnel we, we, we can use. The future may show that we'll come up with a mental health worker a generic mental health worker who can work almost with any type of case and keep a few specialists in the background. You know how doctors have general practitioners who bring in the specialists when needed? Perhaps we'll develop a generic type worker who can uh, duplicate that position. Trouble in mind and I'm blue But I won't be blue always Because the sun's gonna shine in my back door someday. There's a kind of comfort and security in the old patterns and traditions. It isn't easy to break away from the tried and true. The methods we know have worked in the past, whether it's baking a cake, teaching a class, or healing the sick. But increasingly, skilled professionals are recognizing that the forms and traditions of the past may not serve the future. They are searching for new ways to help solve the long-term and short-term problems with which our world abounds. There's a search going on in this unpretentious building in Washington, D.C. is a pilot project sponsored by several health agencies to determine new ways of preventing serious emotional problems from developing during a child's earliest years. We're training a very carefully selected group of women to be counselors in child development. Um, they are to work in well baby clinics or nursery schools or daycare, wherever parents of young children can be found and talked to. The um, sponsors of the program felt that if we could reach parents of children who were infants and preferably under three, certainly under five, that by counseling and by teaching, 
these parents, we could prevent a lot of uh, problems that might come up later. So many times, uh, children that are seen in uh, clinics or in treatment centers uh, are school age, and their problems are just pretty well fixed and difficult by that time. In 1960, the National Institute of Health invested approximately 9,000 man hours in the training of eight women in another new profession, that of mental health counselor. It really came out of two concerns. One is that there, there aren't enough people in this field. There just aren't enough people trained to do psychotherapy. And a lot of people have been wondering if there weren't some untapped resources. And middle-aged women who'd raised their kids seemed like uh, maybe one source. That was one of the concerns. And the other is um, a, an ongoing concern uh, that certainly hasn't been solved, and that's who should do psychotherapy and how should they be trained. And some people had thought for a long time that it might be possible to train people just to be therapists, that is, not to be social workers and learn about the social agencies in a community, not to be doctors and learn all that's involved in that, and not to be psychologists who learn another body of knowledge, like administering tests, but just to do therapy. So that, um, in a way, our training program was unique in two ways, that it, it trained a different population, that is, women who didn't have anything to do, and it trained them in a different way, in a way that some people think has implications for all future training of, of people doing therapy. To professionals trained in the traditional ways, it is often difficult, sometimes impossible, to accept an idea as radical as this one. Training so specialized, and as some would insist, so narrow. A study conducted by the University of Maryland indicates that a majority of chairmen of departments of psychiatry in 52 medical schools viewed the employment of such non-traditionally trained counselors as unlikely. The same attitude was found among a similar number of deans in schools of social work. What happens when these new members of the mental health team actually go to work? Is there still criticism? Not criticism so much. But it, it, it does seem to be necessary to do a good deal of explaining. This isn't so difficult in the Washington area. Nearly everybody knows about the program. I think we would be uh, much harder put to it if we were to move from this area. Um, and um, there, there have been people who haven't understood where we were to fit in. I think, in general, that's worked out as we went to work. I mean. Uh, each clinic that each of us has been in or any working situation in time. You know, you're, you know, I'm, I'm Lois Showalter, and really mental health counselor is, is hardly a part of it. But at the beginning, I think there's some uneasiness about who this new type of person is. Well, I think a fully trained psychiatrist should certainly deal with all problems that, that have to do with a serious emotional disturbance. We found very good acceptance, though, from psychiatrists about preventive work because they're most appreciative of not having uh, problems that could have been prevented. We are also, I think, appreciated by psychiatrists because most of the people that are clients, uh, that, that are clients of the counselors, are not people that would go to a psychiatrist anyway. These are, the problems are in the very beginning stages, they're rather mild, they're problems of education and of child rearing, and they don't, they don't really conflict. If uh, we're being very careful to train our counselors to pick up and to refer a problem that they feel is one that a psychiatrist should handle. And for this reason, they are given in our program individual supervision by a psychiatrist and a clinical psychologist and uh, three or four hours of case discussion by two psychiatrists, because this is important that they recognize their own limitations. Professionals are quick to point out the dangers which exist in any training method. One of the things that we, that we have to work at constantly is uh, uh, educating the nurse to recognize what her own limitations are in the field of uh, psychiatry and in mental health problems. 
we educate primarily uh, so that the nurse will recognize when these problems exist, know how far she can go and when she needs to get some help for the patient. Well, I think that it's helpful for um, people who are in uh, professional capacities of that sort to know something about how to deal with mental problems. I think one of the assets is to be able to judge when one has competence to deal and when one needs to really get um, trained psychiatric or psychoanalytic help for an individual. It's beginning to be resolved. The psychiatrist is now talking to the general physician and the general physician is becoming less afraid to talk to the psychiatrist. And they do write letters or call on the telephone now about their mutual patients. So in a way, the medical profession is resolving this problem, and we hope that the spinoff will involve every other profession too and not allow this communication block or this gap in the, uh, the help that the patient needs. The problem that I see in experimentation is in... Uh, raising a group of people who have the fantasy that they are in the position to do the whole job of diagnosing, making the appropriate decisions, and caring for people, and setting up and out a new cadre of professionals unrelated to the existing structure, unrelated to the existing medical or institutional community, and then confusing people as to whom do I go to. As long as we can keep uh, experiment within our institutions and in the training programs for people who will supplement our institutions. This is one of the reasons I've been using extending our arms, working, and this is one of the things that some of your experimental projects emphasize. They are part of the team, they work in the clinic, the children's workers work in the clinic under the supervision of the physician, the uh, mental health counselors work as a part of a team where the when the real problem of mental illness comes up, a physician is in the position to make the decisions. When they can be uh, used in this way, I think some of the experimental procedure, experimental uh, uh, areas may turn out to be quite valuable. We see these people as bulwarking the efforts of the psychiatrist and the social worker with skills that are totally unique uh, they are not junior psychiatrists, they're not junior social workers, they have something different to offer. They are far more effective when they can be a member of the team. I, I do think there are the problems of trying to fit into a degree conscious society without, you know, the, the card, the, the degree that, that opens the doors. And uh, this is something of a problem. I think if, if there were some way that the that the same kind of training could be duplicated within a university setting with some kind of degree at the end, it, it would be preferable. I, I, you know, I would like having somebody make me a master's of some kind of counseling just because life would be easier. Institutions who would like to employ our people are having some trouble. Now, the salary scale that has been paid them is quite competitive with other uh, forms of employment with the same amount of educational requirements. But it is true that agencies are having a hard time creating new job categories. This holds for our state as well as for private agencies. Uh, the classification system we have now for state hospital employees does not include the child care worker. This work with parents and young children, because it is preventive, is difficult to measure. But I sometimes call it a seeding operation. We hope that these parents will have a better relationship to their children, particularly in the first three years, than that this will be a good background for a more healthy child. We also hope that these parents will learn to use counseling, to go for counseling very, very soon, rather than to wait until something has become serious and needs treatment. The major difficulty is that the needs are so great and the highly trained people are so few that it is practically impossible to imagine that if we depend 
only on the most highly skilled people, our psychiatrists, for instance, that we will ever be able to reach more than a certain small, relatively small percentage of the problems in living that exist. My hedges are turning brown And my house is falling down Doesn't anybody know my name? My sweetheart's up and wed And my mama's took to bed Doesn't anybody know my name? Won't you tell me if you can What time do the trains roll in To 10, 6, 18, 10, 44 Won't you tell me if you can What time do the trains roll in To 10, 6, 18, 10, 44 presently is that we don't have enough facilities, you see. Yes, there are waiting lists. Uh, unless it's an extreme emergency, uh, they wouldn't get any help. In the current situation, some people who have a psychiatric diagnosis are not going to be able to get treatment. This doesn't make sense. If they had uh, a coronary or a pneumonia and had to stand around waiting three years for help, they'll be eventually seen if they wait long enough. There's never going to be enough specialized care. And we push them out into the areas of uh, quasi-medical uh, profession or the advisors or the tea leaf readers. We are constantly involved in a coordinating function. We are just the link between those people and the resources to meet them. I don't think this is nearly enough. I don't think it even begins to, to meet the need. Yes, Pittsburgh could use more outpatient uh, service. We'll probably never have enough trained people to really keep up with it. I don't think we uh, know which profession is best able to treat people. The doctor could uh, have a nurse as a co-therapist with him. A nurse is required to do many other things than we previously thought. And we could do more even in, in helping the families who are the first line of defense. The future may show that we'll come up with a mental health worker, a generic mental health worker who can work almost with any type of case. Education all the way up and down the line is important as far as I'm concerned. One way or another, we got to move. No matter how much we may profess to want to experiment, try new ideas, Change is always difficult for individuals, but especially for institutions, both public and private. Meanwhile, the most pioneering spirit may be suppressed by well-meaning citizens who prefer the status quo to the chaos of change. What does it all add up to? Psychiatrists, social workers, psychologists, clergymen, counselors, co-therapists, psychotherapists. What is the true focus of attention? Is it the role of the professional? Or is it the troubled mind of the disturbed individual? In the final analysis, don't we have all these professional people because we have troubled minds in this world? Then isn't the question that of being the greatest help to the greatest number of people, troubled people, mentally or emotionally ill people? How important are these troubled people we keep talking about? Important enough to be concerned about? Important enough for us to bend our rigid conventions a little? to re-examine our procedures, important enough to eclipse professional differences? Do you think they're that important? Important enough to bring about changes aimed at helping them now, not five or 10 years from now? Important enough to precipitate a crash program aimed at staffing clinics and providing necessary personnel to extend the effectiveness of the highly skilled but scarce professionals? As important as all that? I think so. 
Can't help but wonder where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Can't help but wonder where I'm bound. It's a hot and dusty road. It's a hard and heavy load. And the folks you meet ain't always kind. Some are bad, some are good. Some have done the best they could. Some have tried to ease my troubled mind. And I can't help but wonder where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Can't help but wonder where I'm bound. I have been around this land just to doing the best I can. Trying to find what I was meant to do. And the faces that I see are as worried as can be. And it looks like they are wondering too. And I can't help but wonder where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Can't help but wonder where I'm bound. And I can't help but wonder where I'm bound, where I'm bound. Can't help but wonder 